All right, welcome to the first uh, talk in track one. We're going to get started here in just a second. Uh, again, uh, one of the fortunate things about having track one is I get to introduce a lot of friends up here. Uh, I've got Kyle Temkin and Dominic, and despite the fact that he's last name is abnormally short, he's no less of a man than I am. <laughs> Dominic Spill is up here to present on Face Dancer 2, so please welcome them to the stage. Sorry for uh, taking a few minutes to get set up there. Um, it turns out you shouldn't run Ubuntu updates like 20 minutes before you give a talk. Uh, so, so my X server doesn't work, so I can't show you any of the demos on my laptop. We're going to try the best as we can on, uh, on K10kin's laptop here. Um, so these are our names, um, which has already been mentioned. Um, yep, so this is this work. So that one work? I can turn it on. Turn it on. First. There we go. This is we're deep good magic. With technology. All right, there um, we go. I hear myself. So yeah. this is not at all a 100% original work. We are standing on the shoulders of a lot of people. The probably two biggest names on here in terms of this project are Travis Goodspeed and Sergey, who actually conceptualized this over a bottle of whiskey, as a legend goes. And then later, the Goodfet project, which is the original uh, home of Face Dancer, uh, became the intellectual property of Great Scott Gadgets via transaction that, as I understand it, involved $5 in beer. Mm -hmm. And oh, we need to switch places. So. Yeah, yeah you five, to, $5 cash. Because Travis probably doesn't believe in other currencies. I don't know. Uh, and as you can hear fairly vocally in the second row here is Mike Osman. Um, so let's not thank him. Um, <laughs> he, he designed, uh, it, he employs me uh, for a start, so thanks for that. But uh, he designed this hardware, which uh, we call Great Fet, which is a new generation version of the Good Fet. It also replaces uh, Travis Goodspeed's Face Dancer in many ways. And we'll come on to that in a, in a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about Micah's work? Yeah, so you'll see a demo from uh, my friend Micah, goes by Scanlime, uh, who was one of the first users of the new Face Dancer 2 platform, whether she liked it or not. Um, then, of course, we have our employers who yeah. actually paid us to do the work, and we won't talk about them. Yeah, we're employed by these people. Um, so, like, most people uh, ask us why we hack on USB, and it's because it's literally everywhere. I mean, it's the, the most common interface in... Thanks, Mike, for laughing at my joke. Uh, so uh, it's like the most common interface. It's it's everywhere. I've got more like USB outlets in my house than I have power outlets. Um, so some of them deliver power. Some of them are data. They're hooked up to all sorts of weird embedded systems that you don't have any control over. Almost every single one of those embedded systems is running like a 10 to 15 year old Linux kernel. So like, but that's cool because there have never been any Linux bugs, as my laptop will show you. Um, and the other reason is, and I, I find myself quoting uh, Josh Wright quite a lot, uh, in fact he said it here um, a few years back, which is um, about why we need to build tools. And um, one of the reasons that the, the two of us and, and Mike and various other people we work with build tools is that like, we, can, we can talk about flaws in, in code and we can talk about problems with hardware interfaces, but until we've got a way for someone to pick up a device, plug it into your laptop and own your laptop, People are going to just ignore them and say, yeah, it's not a practical attack. Um, and I think by building the tools to enable that, we allow people to get closer to um, or, or have more leverage trying to solve those problems and have those arguments within organizations to, to solve those problems. Um, and I've previously heard this described as like, you know, it, it's not an attack until um, a script kitty can just, you know, run, run, build something and run or run something that they downloaded from the internet. And I think that. That's kind of in 2017, that's probably more like a journalist. So if you can go to a journalist and say, here's a device, plug it into a laptop, and it'll like weird things will come up on the screen, then they're going to pay attention and hopefully write articles about us. Um, right. Yeah. So why do we want to hack on USB other than the fact that everything down to our cars these days has USB ports? My car takes firmware updates over USB. Um, you can imagine how secure that is. I haven't been able to find out because my spouse will kill me if I brick their car. But so the kind of classic use case for Face Dancer is finding vulnerabilities in USB or driver stacks. So the actual USB stack running on your PC that runs USB, whatever embedded system that runs USB, or the drivers that are sitting on top of that stack. So if you have like a USB mass storage device, there's going to be a USB attached SCSI driver sitting on top of the actual USB stack. And you can find vulnerabilities in either of those. But this has actually been used, um, especially as legacy face dancer, in a lot of other ways, including building tools that work with existing software. So if you want to prototype something really quickly uh, or trick a piece of software, 
into working with a device that is not quite its security dongle. You can do that with Face Dancer really quickly. My favorite new application for Face Dancer, and one of the things that we're going to be talking a lot about, is that it actually lets you get a foot in the door in terms of understanding embedded systems. So a lot of times you have an embedded system with a USB port, you know nothing else about it, and you'll probably wind up with a divorce if you take it apart. Um, <laughs> like my Nintendo Switch, yeah. but... <laughs> Yeah, so so we own like between between us we own what like three Nintendo Switches because two are for playing with and one is for hacking. That's right. Because that that's why they're scarce. Yeah. Um, because of us. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. We've eaten the supply. But, uh, there's but, also a point on this on this slide about playing NSA and um, oh sorry, we not finished uh, with the previous. Gonna, but I, I was just gonna say like it's just fun to play NSA and like who in the room doesn't love pretending they're the NSA? I mean, I, I guess. Well, yeah, like people who work, people who already work for the NSA, sure, right? Yeah, everyone who already works for the NSA, raise your hand, and uh, not you, but everyone, no, worth a try. Um, and and one of the things I think you were saying about, uh, oh, I should stop stepping away from the microphone, um, about getting closer to analyzing black box systems is um, an interesting thing that we can do with this system that we can't do with with other devices necessarily is, is we can actually log in a lot of inf interesting information and kind of metrics about systems that we're talking to. So if we spoof a, a USB mass storage dongle, like if you can, if you take a dongle and you go plug it into a computer and like maybe that system will read the files off there and maybe it'll automatically run your, your malware if you're lucky or whatever. But, but for us, we can start doing things like profiling the system. So I can go up to a TV with, with um, our face dancer code, I can plug in as a USB mass storage system, and I can look at how it reads the file system that I'm pretending to present to it. And at that stage, we can start saying, well, okay, it reads this block like 50 times, it reads the, the first block of the file system 50 times repeatedly for no apparent reason, must be a Windows system. And <laughs> Window, I think Windows XP reads fat file systems first block like a bunch of times for no apparent reason, back to back, and then and then goes off and does other things. Linux and BSD will do other different things. So you can you can profile what the host is by the way they access the file system. Right. And the same and, is going to go beyond for, even that how they enumerate the device itself. So even if the device doesn't have mass storage, doesn't have any capability, I can plug into like my rental car and see what operating system that rental car is likely running, usually down to a rough approximation of version. So yeah. like if the first thing it does is set an address to the USB device, I know it's OS X, and I'm really freaked out because my rental car is running the same system that this presentation is. But uh, yeah, exactly. And and there's in fact I fixed a bug in a USB stack recently where Linux says, "How big are your your descriptors? How much data am I getting from you?" Okay, I'm going to request 32 bytes because that's what you tell me you've got. And Windows says, "Eh, you've probably got less than 256 bytes. I'll just request 256 bytes." And you only the the device is supposed to only send it back 32 bytes because that's all it's got. And um, there was a bug whereby we were not telling it we were done sending data and things like that. And so the Windows system would be sat there waiting for more data. But from the device side, I can tell what kind of device is enumerating me by how many bytes it requests like in the first transaction that it, um, that it talks to me. Right. So like two weeks ago when we bricked Mike's projector, we knew oh. exactly how we bricked Mike's projector. Yeah, that's, that's uh, very true. And we, we, do we want to come on to that now? Talk about that now or come on to that later? We'll come on to it later. OK. Um, in general, don't lend us things that have USB ports. Uh, right. So, point of this slide, really in terms of how USB works, we've done a bunch of studying of USB and probably for this kind of application we use about 1% of it, yeah. something like that. So the USB spec is hundreds of pages long as of the 3.0 revision, it's still hundreds of pages long as of 2.0. Um, there's a 36-page chapter called Chapter 9, which is almost everything you need to do USB hacking, and that is like really sparsely populated pages, probably right. about 10 pages of reading if you want to be able to do basic USB hacking. Right. So, isn't, isn't the Linux kernel header file for all the stuff you need called CH9? I think so. Like, yeah. So, so like they named their header file after like the two chapters you care about from the USB spec. So, right. go look at the header file names and just read those chapters. Done. Right. So, uh, Chapter so, 9 describes so how a device. Done, right? Yeah. Right. right. Um, so, okay, we're going to run through this relatively quickly because, um, yeah, well, one, we're running late, and two, it's, it's USB, um, and hopefully you either know about it or are willing to go and read those two chapters because they explain it better than we do. But uh, largely, if you think back to the 90s, a, a simpler time, um, and, well, in terms of 
computer interfaces a more complicated time. And you'll see here a delightful picture I managed to find of serial ports and parallel ports and PS2. And you needed to like remember how to set up the speed on your serial port and your which mode your parallel port was running. And um, a smart engineer who I should really know the name of at Intel decided this was absolute rubbish. And um, there should be one single interface that was, was uh, able to support all these different devices that you wanted to plug into a PC. Right. So if you ever used like a USB to serial adapter, like one of the USB to legacy RS-232 style adapters, and tried to communicate with the device, if you're on Linux, for example, you've probably seen the operating system running a program called Modem Manager that just spams a bunch of things into the port. So your USB devices tend not to work the first time. That was your USB to serial devices tend not to work the first time. And that's just because back when things were running off things like RS-232, there was no way to plug in a device and know what device that was. You had to kind of guess and check. So a modem manager sends a bunch of AT commands as soon as you plug anything that looks like a serial port into the computer. And it's trying to figure out whether there's a modem there. So USB, one of its major contributions, one of the major benefits of USB over something like RS-232 is that it allows you to plug in a device and you'll see immediately Windows, for example, will pop up and say, hey, you've plugged in a new device, it'll identify it by name, it'll possibly tell you what type of device, and it'll start looking for a driver. And that's all because as part of the standardization and the effort to get this down to a single port, USB built in a lot of standard protocol onto the regular bus transactions that enable it to do that self-identification or enumeration process. Right, so, so the first thing the USB, in fact, this is not the slide I thought it was. No. Um, the first thing, the, uh, the USB is just like, it's just two wires. There's two wires for power and there's two wires for data in your, in your standard USB cable. Up to 2.1. Yeah, yeah. So a, a regular, a, not USB super speed. ignore super speed, which we're ignoring, everything that you can hack right now is pretty much easily hackable on 2.0 with maybe a couple of exceptions. Right. Um, right. And, and almost anything that supports USB super speed supports regular USB as anyway. So like... Yep. Let's, let's attack that until we need to worry about the higher speed and until someone designs hardware to attack it. Hint, Osman. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but basically you've got these things called endpoints. L largely you've got two wires. It's logically split into different endpoints. I guess uh, you could conceptually think of them a little bit like like uh, different ports on a network connection. Kind or of like, like that. So like, one of the goals of USB is to be able to have more than one tr logical kind of transaction going over the bus at the same time. In order to do that, they basically say, I have two wires, but conceptually I'm going to pretend like I have more like 16 channels that I can send data bidirectionally through. And that is just done by taking every transaction that goes over USB with an endpoint number. So while you have two physical wires, you can think of it as being able to send 16 disparate, up to 16 disparate communications at a time, and it will worry about sequencing them over the bus. This is another good example of why uh, it's so much easier to worry about things kind of from our level of abstraction, because the device doesn't have to worry about any of that. It's all the host's job to figure out how things go over the bus, and the device just kind of conceptually demultiplexes it for you. Right. And, the, and these um, endpoints are, are kind of tied together in groups as, of interfaces, and, and those um, oh no, it's still not the slide I think it is. It's okay. Uh, but they're tied together in like interfaces which have kind of potentially uh, like functions associated with them. So you can have a device that says, hey, I'm a keyboard, I'm also a mouse, I'm also a network connection, I'm also a mass storage device, and it just has more and more endpoints to support those. And largely those are hardware limited by the, the um, controller you're using. Um, and that's one of the reasons we like the chip that we're using on, on GreatFet is that it allows us to be quite flexible about the number of devices we appear as and the type of devices we appear as and things like that. Right, um, so a, a common example would be if you have a camera, usually those have a video device, an audio device, and something that's letting you, for example, press play pause, or, that's or communicated as a keyboard, focus, yeah. right? And those kind of devices actually, even though they're conceptually one device, they have one function, they appear as multiple independent communication channels, actually with each with their own drivers. Those are just conceptually organized into a set of different endpoints. Right. So there's four kinds of endpoints that USB supports. I, really, we will be talking about the first two. Yeah. I, also, we have 36 minutes left. Yep. So I don't think I don't know how much anyone cares about the four different types of endpoints. They make different guarantees about what, how fast you get data, latency, throughput, that sort of thing. Um, again. If, if, in fact, we mentioned going to look at the USB spec, but if you look at the bottom left of this screen, it says uh, this came from USB in a nutshell, which if you Google that, it's a website that 
basically precedes the chapters you need to know from the USB spec and adds nice diagrams. And honestly, that's the only resource. I've never read the USB spec. That's the resource I've used to read, to implement USB devices and things. So any, any tweaks I've ever made to like HackerF or RFCAT or Ubertooth or any of their USB stacks have come from that website, not from the USB spec, because it just explains it really, really nicely at a level that you need to care about. Um, so, so that's worth looking at. Uh, the, uh, in addition to the um, three kind of high, sp high speed endpoints listed here, there's control endpoints. They go in both directions, and that's kind of how you configure devices. It's how the system, they always exist, and the system requests um, descriptors about what the device is from there. So when you type LSUSB on your laptop, that information has been received by the kernel using control endpoints and control requests, and they allow you to send data out to the device to configure it, to tell it, you know, tune to this frequency. Um, or, or receive data from the device, say, oh, what frequency are you tuned to? But when we want to stream high data rate data on, on a, say, our SDR platform, HackerF, you can um, you use bulk endpoints to get the higher throughput. Um, and so and they, they offer different guarantees. Kind of the important thing here is that every USB device has to support a standard set of requests. These control requests are used for enumeration. They're used for things like, and when you plug in the device, the first thing it'll do is say, hey, what kind of device are you? Tell me a description of yourself. Send me a device descriptor. And that device descriptor will say, here's my vendor ID, here's my product ID, here's everything you would theoretically need to load a driver for me. And being able to emulate all this standard stuff enables you to actually pretend to be a USB device. And one of the nice things that the Face Dancer library actually provides for you is all the boilerplate for USB communications. So you can go and plug in a device and just emulate the limited amount that you want to in order to describe your particular device. It handles all the boilerplate, handles all the, you know, handles all the standard transactions. So the Face Dancer takes a lot of this burden away from you. So if you want to hack something using Face Dancer, theoretically you don't even have to know how this kind of stuff works. Yeah, this is all abstracted away from you. We're just telling you now so you know that we did it for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the slide I've been waiting for. Right, enumeration. When you plug in a device, the port on your laptop or, or other system says, oh, there's a device here, tells the kernel, and the kernel says, okay, I'm gonna send a control request. Tell me what kind of device you are. At which point, the device sends back some bytes. Obviously, with face dancer, we get to pick what those bytes are. Um, when you plug in a mass storage device, they, it has it all hard-coded in there. It's all uh, stored in, in some kind of long-term storage on the device. Um, and those generally, uh, as, as you just said, are used to determine which driver to load. And there are a couple of different ways that happens. Um, so every device, every device is supposed to have a vendor ID and a product ID. And the vendor ID says, I was made by this company. And the product ID says, I am this specific product. And sometimes these are important because, for example, if you want to plug in, um, I'm failing to think of a single USB device now. Um, if you want to plug in uh, one of those FTDI USB to serial cables, the driver wants to know that it's FTDI and will go and load the FTDI driver into the kernel and, and give it the device. And then that, that kernel module will say, oh, I know this product ID. This thing has these different modes. It operates at this rate. I can control this. And that's one way to do it. But not everyone has the ability to get code for their device into the kernel on, especially not on a wide array of operating systems. And so sometimes those things are um, made out to be a kind of standard classes. Right. So when a device describes itself, it can do one of two things. It can say, I am this vendor ID and product ID, and this is exactly the driver you need to load for me. Or it can just say, hey, I'm a keyboard. The USB spec, in addition to defining the actual communications protocol, also defines a bunch of standard class drivers that can be used to say, if you're a keyboard, talk in a standard way, really increasing the amount of machines you're likely to work with. That's why anyone can produce a keyboard. They don't have to go and work and get a driver into the Linux kernel and the Windows kernel. Right. You could just plug in your keyboard or your flash drive or your printer, and you know, depending on, you know, if you're assuming you have like a regular HP that was supported back when, then it'll just work out of the box. Course, right, and, and it, as long as you're willing to make your device conform to a, a standard set of, uh, um, like a sort of standard API, then you know that it's going to be supported by a huge number of, of target, um, 
uh, target systems. So, for example, if you build a keyboard, really people want to type on your keyboard and the characters to appear on screen. You don't need fancy kind of multicolored backlights and things like that. And you can add them as an additional interface or you can, you can do weird things like that. But you want to know that if I take whatever keyboard I pick up from someone and go plug it into any system that supports USB keyboards, it'll just work. And that's because they use the human interface device class. Uh, the other fun thing about the human interface device spec, and that one is worth a read, is that a lot of their examples revolve around data gloves because it was written in the late 90s and somebody who wrote this spec thought data gloves were going to be a way we interacted with things. And so it's actually a really cool spec because it was written back in the 90s. They were trying to anticipate theoretically everything that could happen. They were able to come up with a spec that was constrained enough that you can do things like have a full touch screen with five finger multi-touch. And that original spec was enough that those kind of devices would work. It's been expanded since with a little bit more, but the spec itself was kind of comprehensive and general enough that it actually allowed these devices that are coming in the future to work, including you know data gloves whenever those drop. Yeah, like it, it's weirdly forward thinking, but also it's 90s forward thinking, which is like it's pretty. It, it's fun to go and look at the examples. Um, but, but those things are there. Like if, if someone wants to build a data glove, you can just read the spec and conform to the USB data glove spec. And Linux and Windows and, and uh, Mac OS, I guess, will probably support it in whatever way it's supposed to work. I don't even know how it's supposed to work, but I really want it. <laughs> I, wanna, I, I don't know. Sounds so good. The really cool thing about this is that Face Dancer doesn't just give you a platform for hacking on USB. It gives you a platform for hacking on anything that rides atop USB. So some of the things that we've done include actually just taking advantage of the way devices interact with disks. And that was super easy for us to do. We just said, hey, I'm a flash drive. Now I'm going to be handled by your operating system's disk driver. We didn't have to do any kind of special hardware to emulate a disk. We just said, OK, I'm emulating the transport. And that enables all these kinds of applications. And, and these USB device classes are defined at an interface level there. So you, you have. Um, the device descriptors which say, hey, I'm this product ID, I'm this, I was made by this company, and I'm this product. And then you have interfaces, and you can, like I was mentioning earlier, you have multiple, you can have multiple interfaces, so a device, single device can say, I'm a network device, I'm a audio video, I'm also a data glove. Uh, I'm real obsessed with data gloves. Um, I'm a keyboard, you know, all these things. And it can, it can define all of those, and your kernel will go off and um, load all those drivers and say, okay, here you go. Um, these drivers can now communicate with this device. One of the reasons this becomes kind of interesting is we can specify which driver we want at two different levels. And those levels uh, both happen. Like the, the kernel sees both of those things and, and maybe it, it just picks one or the other. And one of the reasons this is really interesting is there is whitelisting software out there that will light the whitelist by device ID because you only want this very specific keyboard to be hooked up. But I get to control that header, and then at the interface level, I get to say, hey, guess what? I'm a network device. So I get to plug in your whitelisting software and goes, oh, you're the keyboard I expect. That's cool. And then I get to tell another part of the kernel, hey, I'm a network device. And hey, here are driver. some, here's a, here's a DHCP response. And uh, here are some proxy settings. By the way, I'm all the websites on the internet, uh, which is the, the thing um, uh, Rob Fuller, Mubix, did um, last year, I think where he plugged in a USB networking device to a, to a laptop, and it went, oh, your gigabit, your gigabit speed. Cool, you take priority over my wireless network connection because it's slower. And he goes, hey, here's, an, here's my IP address. I am every website on the network, on the internet, and um, you should just send me all like your standard traffic that you want to communicate over my connection instead of the wireless connection. This thing was still locked, and he had a bunch of settings about like things that were already running on air, what was running updates. Like He could get this information out because of the network traffic that just happened while the machine was locked. Um, which was kind of a fun little information leak. Um, and we could do that even if USB networking devices were pot uh, potentially not whitelisted. Now, this doesn't apply to all systems because there are um, tools that will um, hash the entire USB descriptor and whitelist the hashes rather than whitelisting the, the IDs. But that's not all of them. Yeah, so an open USB prover. Oh, yeah, we don't have, I, I don't know how to use a Mac. Sorry. This is all right, hopefully the font's large enough. Essentially, I have, this is a list of the devices that are plugged into my USB port right now. I actually have no physical USB devices plugged in. There's already two devices that talk via USB, a card reader and the Bluetooth USB host controller that are just built into my system. If I plug in a real device, you'll see basically the same thing. We can kind of look at the stuff that we were talking about. So you can see that this, 
uh, Bluetooth USB host controller actually has 10 endpoints that it uses. And we can go down and see the device descriptor. The device descriptor says, hey, I'm an Apple device. I was produced by Broadcom, so Apple's vendor ID, even though the manufacturer string reads Broadcom, which I guess makes sense if you're someone. Um, has the product string. These are all data that's communicated via the enumeration process, including a descriptor that describes how everything winds up being communicated with. And you can see that Bluetooth device actually provides two HID interfaces that say, yeah, I'm accessible at boot. It provides five wireless controllers. We've got some vendor-specific devices that require a specific driver. All this enumeration is ca encapsulated in those standard packets. So without me even having to have a driver, my system is capable of knowing how this device looks, how it communicates, who made it, either Apple or Broadcom, depending on who you believe. And um, no, it's not no, super you, relevant yet. You will admit. I will admit. It. Make it make it larger if you're going to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So we'll go into GVM in a second, and then I'll we'll actually show this off in the face dancer context. There we go. All right. All right. So before we get into the actual specifics and nitty gritties of the demos, um, let's talk about what we've done. So so far we've talked a lot about USB, kind of the interesting things about USB, um, some of the background. We're going to get more into USB as we talk about what we've done and kind of the interesting trust problems with USB. But kind of the history of Face Dancer, again, started like all kind of Travis projects over a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, I mean, I wish it started like all Travis projects as an idea, idea Sergey had and then he outsourced it. Um, so <laughs> it's not a bus, it's a network. And so Travis goes, I'll build a thing. And then at like 3 o'clock the next morning, wow, you're, there we go. Face Dancer exists, and this, and is, this, yeah, this, is, is, this is a Travis Goodspeed's GoodFet with a USB device chip on it. Um, that's, if I got a cursor? Yeah. So, wow, that's, that's not, you, yeah, you yeah. describe it and I'll point. Sure. So, Travis already had his GoodFet at this point. Did the absolute, that's the entire left. If you've seen a GoodFet, that is literally the GoodFet design to the left hand of the board. The one chip on the right there. Dominic's pointing at now, is the USB controller that was added. So this thing is actually a really quick, pretty neat USB attack device, um, USB fuzzing device, that was built using all technology Travis already had in not that long. And it actually, right. as soon as he started using it, he started finding all kinds of things about his systems. Like, for example, in trying to get this to work, he repeatedly crashed his Windows and Linux machines. And That sounds familiar. Yeah. And you know, fast forward, it's been, what, five years, six years, something like that? And now we're at the point where usually when we plug in face dancer things, things don't crash. I usually. mean, now we're at the point where we can reliably crash a Linux machine. Yeah, but, but we, have so, to, we have to work a little bit harder to crash things now. Yeah. And that's in part thanks to the legacy of this face dancer device, because before that, it was one of those attacks that was, oh, it's a physical attack. Someone needs access to your machine. Why do we even care about that? until someone built a proof of concept and then via what we're calling rights law, people actually said, okay, maybe I should care about that. Maybe the fact that you can write over arbitrary kernel memory just by pretending to be whatever USB device you want is not a good thing. Kernel memory is not important. Yeah, that's right. It's the least important memory in your system, right? Right. Right. So <laughs> the, so the really neat thing oh. about what this kind of demonstrated was that the trust boundary for USB is in the middle of nowhere, right? So the device, which is just something you plug into your computer, that you potentially you found on the sidewalk in the free USB bin, is a piece that is inherently sort of trusted by the system to behave correctly. The system assumes that your USB devices are going to behave correctly, the host controller acts accordingly, and then now we have this weird additional world where your browser can communicate with your USB device. So like, there's actually right. a set of standards that let browsers talk to USB devices, and those can be used for all kinds of crazy things like reprogramming the firmware on that USB device to not be malicious. And the next time you plug it into the host, it is limited, luckily, because the, there are certain origin policies that were sort of put into the web USB thing and then didn't really go all the way through. So when web USB starts becoming a thing, um, we're gonna start seeing some really interesting security properties in some of these devices. So right. Travis's original face dancer, do you want to talk about the limitations? Or yeah, I? no, I was going to say this. It's interesting, actually, you talk about the trust boundary and, and this idea that um, I, th I think a lot of the time we hear people kind of uh, freak out a bit about the, the idea that you have um, ports on the outside of your machine that, like, um, 
Thunderbolt ports, and people were saying, well, obviously there were attack vectors because you've got a, a PCI bus on the outside of your machine. It allows DMA. Like, you, you can write straight to memory from a, a thing outside your machine. But, like, that trust boundary has been moving for years because people seem to think USB is, like, slightly more careful about that stuff, and USB doesn't necessarily have direct memory access. But it, it does via the fact that some of the some of the operating systems we all run have like really bad USB drivers, and so like it might not be direct memory access, but it's pretty it's pretty indirect memory access. Yeah, so I'm not and gonna lie, Thunderbolt and PCI are way worse than USB. Oh yeah, but, like I'm not but. I'm not suggesting they're the same thing. I'm suggesting that like we we're already really far down this road. Like just put let's let's fix the fix the way we think about these things rather than like being scared of PCI and Thunderbolt and stuff like that, I think, to a certain extent. Right, and you get Thunderbolt devices you know, on Macs and some Intel laptops. Now, you get a USB port on pretty much everything. Right, so, exactly. And everyone has their own custom USB stack now for their own embedded platforms. They are not making sure that devices are behaving yeah. correctly. They're so all you bad. Get, right, I've, and that's how we... Some. That's They're how we really wind up bad. in circumstances where like plugging a USB flash drive with the wrong file on it will brick Mike's projector. <laughs> it's not even the wrong file. It's it just, just it's just a 128 meg file, and it went nah. And uh, but before it read it, it erased its own operating system. <laughs> <laughs> so to actually give you a story on that, this projector takes its firmware updates via USB, and one of the attacks that we will show you is actually a USB firmware update, USB stick emulation attack. And so we naturally decided to try it on. Mike's projector, which is this adorable little like four inch by four inch projector, really cute. Wouldn't want anything bad to happen to it. And the and so before we even get to that point, we look at the firmware image. It has two files. One says the full path on the flash drive to where the far firmware image is going to load should be. And before we even start that, I just said, okay, let's replace that file with a file that just contains 128 megabytes of null characters, and serve that. And a really cool thing about emulating this is I can see everything that's happening on the device. I can see exactly what it's doing. Right, it's it, that instrumentation thing we were talking about. We can we can see exactly the access patterns, and so we can see that it never read the file. It just got to the point where I said, hey, let me look at what's in this directory. Oh, there's a file that I need to read. It's 128 megabytes long. It allocated 128 megabyte buffer. In the process of doing that, it smashed its own stack, and then the next thing we see is firmware updating. We, it never read a firmware file. We didn't provide one. And it just goes through rapidly, counts to 100, flashing all zeros over the main flash chip for the projector. <laughs> so it's kind this, of is, the kind of, this we, is the kind of weird trust boundary that still exists in USB devices. And like, luckily, there happened to be two computers inside that projector, one that drove the projector and then one that drove the media functionality. And we only managed to, draw, to kind of crash the, and destroy the media functionality PC. So Mike still has like 40% of a projector. <laughs> So we have rained 60% destruction down on that device. All right, um, uh, we only have 20, or just shy of 20 minutes left and we want to get to some demos. So um, I just want to run through what's wrong with the original Face Dancer. It's really slow. Um, the, the, the beauty of adding a chip to, to a good fit meant that um, it was super flexible. The GoodFet libraries already existed. Travis didn't have to write a whole lot of code to, to just add the ability to talk over a spy interface to, to this, um, this peripheral chip. But that spy interface is really slow. It's actually not the spy interface that's slow. Oh, no, Everything goes through an FTDI chip. So if yeah. you look on the left, there's a USB to serial converter. The way the face dancer worked is it took every packet it wanted to send over USB, converted it down to 9.6K baud UART, sent the packet over to the microcontroller, which then talked SPI to the Max USB controller chip. So everything winds up going through this horrible kind of bottleneck where it gets converted to serial to UART and then sent to a microcontroller just because that was the way GoodFet worked. That was the way it was super cheap at the point to make these GoodFet devices. Right, and and to a certain extent, like that's good enough because we want to play with the descriptors. We, we want to look at how the system loads things. We don't actually care how fast it runs. Now, it, theoretically, it'd be possible to build a host stack that detected that you're running at nine kilobits and Maybe. Wait, I mean, eh, on the host stack side, but yeah. I think, I think you potentially could. Potentially, you could start saying, hey, you're taking a little bit longer to respond to these descriptor requests, right. and probably you're not a real USB device. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that you're real. I'm just going to kill the power to the port. Um, nothing does that, as far as we know, um, but, but it's, it's feasible that you could build a host stack that did that. So the much more significant limitation, um, besides the fact that the original uh, 
good fe based phase tensor was really slow, was that the chip that they used, the USB controller, had certain fixed function endpoints. So certain endpoints can only be bulk ins or bulk outs. And that means that if you're trying to take a real USB device, emulate it with some minor modifications or proxy it, which is one of our their man in the middle kind of attacks, you can't do that unless it happens to have exactly the right endpoint setup. So it was a pretty limited chip. It was a great proof of concept, but yeah. at this point, um, that, that attack we were talking about where you say, I'm a keyboard and I'm also a network device and now I'm this other thing and now I'm this other thing, doesn't work over, over original face dancer because you just don't have the endpoints to be able to pretend your weird things necessarily or, or multiple weird things. All right, so let's talk about these boards. So then one of the main benefits of face dancer 2, uh, face dancer 2 came about actually because the original face dancer was too slow for something. So we wound up building uh, actually wound up building one of these rasp dancers, saw that it was um, it was actually much faster when you take out that USB to serial converter. But now I had this problem of that I wanted to be able to support multiple target devices instead of just the original face dancer and instead of just good fet based face dancers. So face dancer two kind of came out as a multi platform uh, version, multi target platform uh, version of face dancer. And then since then we've written the support for Great FET, which is pretty yeah. much our preferred platform because it has the most powerful USB controller on it. Um, if, if anyone went to CCC camp in 2015, which I know is unlikely for this group, but um, there was a badge there that was a, a, modified, a modified design from HackerF that now supports uh, Face Dancer. So soon, it's no longer soon. It's soon no longer now. soon. Yeah. The soon future is now with Face Soon Dancer. is last week. Um, and potentially in the future, we're going to uh, possibly be able to support uh, devices um, like single board computers that already have a USB um, device interface. So like the BeagleBones, the um, smaller Raspberry Pis, some of those things. There's um, Olamex, uh, not Olamex, uh, Odroid makes some and things like that. And that's what my old USB proxy code worked on. But you had to kind of SSH into the thing and, and run like your script in, the, in a little terminal. And one of the things we like about the Face Answer 2 code right now is that I can use my laptop to do mean things to this laptop, and um, it's all running in like host code Python. Um, so the, it's like 10 lines to modify the USB descriptor, if that, like maybe five. Yeah. Um, it's, it's super simple, and like you can plug and go. It's, it's pretty quick. Right. So some of the new features we've um, pretty much discussed we, yeah, we've mostly discussed. We're able to to do proxy things. We're able to man in the middle these these transactions. So I can plug a device into my laptop. I can then present myself as that device to this target laptop. And as the data flows through, I can modify it. I can log it. I can look at how things are working. This is um, this has been used historically to like reverse engineer drivers on on systems. Um, so if you have a Windows driver you want to reverse engineer, you can throw it into a virtual machine and you can just like use. USB mon on the host to monitor the tra USB transactions, but that's not the case if you can't virtualize the system. So USB proxy has historically been used to uh, reverse engineer drivers on three systems, and all of them are games consoles, um, because you can't virtualize a games console. So you plug in a, a, a little interposer board and, and look in the middle um, and reverse engineer them. So we were able to build a little piece of code that injected combo moves into a, um, an Xbox game so that a friend could like prank his friends and suddenly perform some super combo or something in some fighting game uh, because we're professionals. Right. Um, <laughs> I think, um, so yeah, we've talked mostly about this. Um, we already talked about this, so let's, let's go to demos. You want to you demo so, a thing? Okay. Part of our pitch here, um, we're not going to get to the demo yet. First, we're going to show the code. Okay. Hold on. You speak into that one. Yeah. So you this, have is, to actually, stand this still. is one of the more complicated demos because I have to use Vim. Oh, Vim. It's GVim, it's MacVim, so All right, let's quit Vim and start Vim again. Mate. This is dialog box. Okay. So, so all these demos and all this code are open on my laptop, but it just won't show on the projector. In fact, plugging in the adapter crashes my X server, which what? is weird. I mean, like that's what you get for using USB video adapters, I guess, but. Uh, you're going to want to make that text yeah, somewhat I'm bigger, or everyone's just going to have to move a lot further horror. forward. I'm just trying to figure out what font size probably works here. Maybe six. All right. <laughs> All right. I knew how to use my own text editor. It's probably go faster. Should I be saying anything now to 
distract people from the fact that you can't I use can a tech center. No, I can hit control plus, apparently that works. Okay. Awesome. Not open a tree. Okay. So I have to actually open a USB serial device. Yep. And not the thing which instantiates it. So this code is the entirety of an emulator that emulates USB serial converters, which is cool because, one, it's super simple, so it makes a really good demo. The USB to serial device that we're using is actually called Simple Serial. All that it does is communicate over two endpoints. So it needs to enumerate itself, say who it is, and basically take data in, spit data out. So if you look at this file, there's a minimum amount of boilerplate here that basically says, hey, this is how a USB device should look. There's two endpoints. One is in, one is out. We have the actual USB interface that describes those endpoint encapsulates those. This is all the USB standard required stuff. And then we have this hand handle data available function. This is the actually from line 79 to line 89. In those 10 lines is the entirety of the emulation. This code was, I think, originally written by Travis. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way this has been written, most of this is just passing data from one variable to another. So really, the actual emulation code itself is two lines. We have a replace and an upper. And then we have send on endpoint. So this. So, so all this does as a device is you send it uh, characters, and it sends them back to you as uppercase characters. Um, so it's like uppercase as a service. Um, but it turns out like this is enough. This is enough code just to get uh, a kernel, uh, to get the Linux kernel to load a driver called the USB Simple Serial driver. And Simple Serial is kind of cool. Um, there's a small handful of those USB IDs that are assigned to being this very simple serial protocol. Uh, one of them is HP calculators. Um, so if you pretend to be an HP calculator and and talk to Linux system, it will pop up as a USB serial device um, within the system and it will start sending you AT commands, right? Because it thinks you're a modem? Yep. Or yeah, it'll still think you're a modem, right? Because it sees a serial device? I yeah, can't so remember now. if you're running now. modem manager, it will actually start trying to talk to your emulated device as... And so, so and like there's no, like, this will happen if the laptop's locked and you just plug in and you go, yeah, I'm a modem, why not? Um, and so, like, and, and all you have to do is just fill out this, this function in Python and say, how do you want to respond to things? How do you want to respond to AT commands? How do you want to talk to the, the host system? Um, and do you want to plug this in? And I will do things to your laptop. Sure. I because said we have, no one ever. We have less than yeah. 10 minutes left, so let's uh, get on some other, other demos. OK. Uh, Are you running that? Yeah, what am I running? Yeah, no, wow. So I'll run Face Dancer. Let's, um, let's switch this around, because <laughs> I honestly thought it was plugged in the other way around. So top tip, plug in the USB cable the right way around. We practice this talk. I swear. All right. All right. So the main thing you're going to see here is that suddenly I've got a new device. Um, let me save the output so you can see this. It crashed on my machine. It's okay. All right. Your machine is really not. My happy. machine hates USB. So um, if you go back and look through the great, either the great fail or the face dancer repository, you'll see a commit. Uh, from early August, where I was sat in a field in the Netherlands, like hacking away at this at the Shah Hacker Camp, and there's just a commit that says something along the lines of, "Hey, this re reliably crashes my uh, Linux host stack. Investigate," and pushed it to GitHub just in case anyone wants to investigate that. So go nuts! Yeah. But uh, so yeah, it will reliably like just kill my laptop, so my laptop no longer right. like you have to hard. Let's let's continue reset. this. Case. So. What you saw, which was super exciting, was basically a new USB device popped up. It said it was an HP calculator, because that was the product ID that we stole. Um, if we wanted to do the full demo, we could actually open it up. It's a serial port that you type into, and it uppercases all your text. I think you can imagine what that looks like, so I think we'll go on to some of the more interesting uh, things that we can do with this before we open up for questions. So my favorite application, and kind of the token application that Face Dancer 2 enabled, that I think is really cool, is what I call US, UMS double fetch. That's a USB mass storage double fetch. And it really is kind of summarized by these two bullet points. So in practice, most systems assume that disk contents, disk contents do not change on their own. But when you're emulating the disk, they totally can. So if you have a device like any of the devices we've had so far, we've had like projectors and copiers that have an embedded USB host that take their firmware update over USB, usually they don't have a lot of memory. 
which means they can't take a firmware file that's stored in memory, run their checks to see that the signatures are okay, and then apply it. Most of the time, instead, they read the file once, they go procedurally through it, compute their checksums, or compute, you know, just make sure that the signature matches, and then they have to reread it a second time. And what that means is that if we are sitting there pretending we're a USB device, we can do all kinds of things like, say, serve up the correct firmware file the first time it's read, and then the second time serve up whatever the heck we want. So the kind of practical version of this demo that we usually give um, when we're trying to show this off is just to take a file, serve it up, it shows up looking like a flash drive, and then we just compute its checksum twice, and the second time it is completely Right, I will happily show anyone this demo in the bar afterwards, but uh, it only works against, oh, well, apparently it's not working against your laptop right now. So, yeah. But I can, I can do it to myself. Yeah. And yeah, as long as you, you on, a, on a host system, you have to drop the disk caches because uh, like, I have enough memory to read the file once and cache it. But on an embedded system, you don't have that RAM. So, um, so like, you can show that you're just serving the same file twice and it, and it perfectly works. And you have a working, if you go on GitHub right now, there's a full working script on there that has oh, been I mean, demonstrated uh, against a couple of platforms. That's what I was going to say. So you have a you have a working like working attack against a full size photocopier, yep. but like it's real hard to take one of those on a plane. So, but like big big old um, things from uh, well the company you're thinking of, um, uh, <laughs> like plug in a plug in this this device and you can serve it two firmware updates, um, and and one will be signed and the other one will will succeed and you can do whatever you like to it. Yeah, so another cool demo that I'm not gonna show, um, but Close I, microphone. yeah, I do it. Oh, take this one, I don't mind. Okay, here, we'll switch. Considering I can't stand still. So one of the cool things that my friend Micah did, uh, actually, if you've seen her proof of concept to get the fuck out article, um, she actually was able to steal the firmware from Wacom tablets by using glitching attacks on USB. Related, not driven by Phase Dancer right now, but totally cool, so you should check it out. Once she got those firmware images, she found that it was for an architecture that had basically no public tooling. The one thing she was able to find was a debugger that, would, that had a disassembler built in. So she had all the program there that would do disassembly of these devices, but she would have had to patch the binary if she wanted to start feeding these things in. Instead, what she did was actually take Face Dancer um, and actually take Great Fit by itself before Face Dancer and modify it so that it said, hey, I'm a debug dongle. This is what I suspect you're doing. This is what I suspect a real debug dongle will be doing. Here's the firmware image I have. This is the current contents of the device memory. Would you disassemble it for me? And by doing that, she was able to actually get a program readout of everything she had stolen from those Wacom tablets, even though she had no vendor-supported tools. She didn't have the debug dongle itself, which was unobtainium. And it, by doing this, she was able to actually go and complete that proof of concept to get the fuck out article, where she was able to take that Wacom tablet and use it as an RFID reader, which was super cool. Yep, so. All right, USB proxy. I wrote, uh, I and some other people wrote a tool called USB proxy a couple of years ago, ran on uh, Big One Blacks or like little embedded, uh, other embedded boards. Um, this is now running over anything that supports Face Dancer 2. Um, and it's gone from being a couple of thousand lines of C++ to being like a couple of hundred lines of Python, which is honestly the pro move. Um, and it does things like uh, log those packets as we're in the middle, it modifies them, it allows us to modify the descriptors, it allows us to inject packets. It doesn't currently work injecting packets, but it will do in the future. Um, it, the idea is like, I have a USB device and I wanna explore how it handles me screwing around with things. Uh, spoiler, it doesn't. Um, do you wanna try doing the thing? You want me to try doing a, a, yeah, we can do that. a quick proxy? No, you want to plug, you wanna plug in HackerF? I have a on, I'm the host. Oh, I was gonna plug it in here and just spoof it to you. Um, I think the, the output is, all right, sure. Whatever. Let's see if I can figure out how to up the size on these. Yes. This is too big. That's still working. Is this big enough? Yeah. Oh, yeah, look, I didn't change the screen. Okay. So I haven't run hacker up before. Let's go for that. Oh. Yeah. Run. All right. Run hacker up info. So um, what you can see here is hacker up info tells you about the uh, um, what the hacker up is attached to. Wow, that was smooth. 
Yeah. Uh, you can, it tells you which, which I'm going to push it up the screen so people at the back can see it. Uh, it just shows you which uh, HackerF is attached to your system. It tells you some information. It gives you the firmware version, which in this case, I have modified in like three lines of Python on my host system to say, hey, hey, you, yes, you talk on attendee. <laughs> Um, which, honestly, I thought was really funny when I wrote it last night. Yeah, but um, you had had a couple of drinks, so... Mate, yeah, you did say that at the time. You said, that won't be as funny, funny tomorrow. tomorrow morning. <laughs> Turns out it's not. Um, so what's actually happening here, I don't have a, a HackRF plugged into my machine at all. I have, there's a HackRF here plugged into Dominic's machine, which is the man in the middle target, and then in between us, linking our machines is this great bet. So right now, when I run HackRF info, it's proxying all of those commands down to the HackRF, one of those commands is, hey, give me a string that describes your firmware. When it does that, it's receiving the actual string that says, hey, I'm the firmware that's been built from Git. And it's taking that string, replacing it with uh, Dominic's uh, biting wit, and <laughs> then displaying it on the screen. So we've actually been able to both proxy packets back and forth and modify them on the fly, and which is really cool. So we could do this with, with any packets. We could change the device ID. So we could take a keyboard that's not whitelisted by your device and we could by your host, and we could change it so it is whitelisted by your. Uh, so it's one that's whitelisted by this thing's now flashing at me because we've gone over time. Wait, I can just reset it. There we yeah, go. We've got, we got 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you Hacks. didn't have lunch plans. <laughs> Hacks. Uh, so um, <laughs> I don't know how to use a Mac, so I don't know how to get back to the slide deck. Just but I think swipe we might your, think swipe your fingers. Oh. Now I understand why people like these things. <laughs> that is nice. OK, um, so, so like it, we could do that. Obviously, like, it turns out HackerF is open source, so you could modify those things yourself. Um, but we could do this uh, to attack systems that we don't have control over, um, like any of these embedded systems. Oh, point of sale is a good one. There are a bunch of point of sale systems that have USB ports of them to have printers come out of them. And somewhere in the world, there's a regulatory requirement to log that information. And I get an email about once every two weeks saying, hey, have you built something for us yet? Um, like we want to log what's being printed. And uh, there was a bug in original USB proxy that went haywire and crashed those systems, which I will happily tell people about later. Um, so we've done a man in the middle attack. All right, future work. Um, we need to, we, need, we want to support anything that has a USB device port. I mean, obviously by great fit. But um, uh, we, anything that has a, a USB device port would be nice to support. So like your phone being able to support face dancer, your, um, your, your printer. You say, you say anything, but anything based off the Linux device class. So hey. we're not that, I mean, we want to, but yeah, um, right. we're not necessarily going to do it, but we want to. Um, but like, I, I've got a printer that's got a host and a device port. It'll talk to my PC, but it'll also talk to my digital camera. So like, supports host and device and probably runs Linux. I could probably make it, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to use a giant printer as an attack vector, but like, it'd be fun. Um, USB, USB 3 would be nice, I guess, um, because that's the new hotness. Or 3.1, USB-C, power, I mean, USB-C currently kills my laptop, so like, tick, job done. Um, and then the other thing is like, GreatFed itself has uh, host and device ports on it. And so we can, um, it has on-the-go ports that support both host and device mode, so we can use it to pretend to be a host to devices and start uh, looking at weird things that happen with devices. What happens when we just send the device way too much data? So the original reason that there wasn't a host controller in the Face Dancer project was because it's easy to do some things from your computer using right. LibUSB. So LibUSB is a great vector for doing some attacks against devices, but it relies on all of the reproducible behaviors of your host controller, which means that it's not good for doing things like precisely timed glitching attacks. It's not good for extracting side channel information, like how long did it take to respond to this particular request. All that kind of stuff can be done if you have complete control over the USB stack. So eventually, um, we can unplug that. Yeah. If you want. Eventually, hopefully, we'll be doing a talk where we demonstrate the host support on that device and demonstrate a lot of things that enables you to do that you can't do on just a PC. So that right. should and enable things like the glitching attack that Micah did, which was capable of stealing firmware from a whole variety of USB devices. Right. It, it's actually one of those scenarios where like the the OS host stacks perf like are, are too compliant and work properly. Like we spent all this time saying, hey they're horrendous and they do bad things. And now what we're saying is, actually, they kind of get in our way because they like they tell us, oh, you can't do that. That's not in, within spec. So, so that's, that's one issue. And the other issue is just that it's really hard to get reproducible timing when you have oh, yeah, 50 USB is, devices yeah. sitting on a, you know, just inside your machine. Yeah. And that bus is shared between all of them. Uh, so we're not going to take questions now because, I don't know, we're way over time. 
Who really knows? This clock stopped ages ago. I, we will take questions afterwards. But if you find us, if you we'll, walk up here, we'll take them outside. Break. Yeah. Um, and that's, is that our last slide? That's our last slide. Piece. We have no more slides. There you go. You're free to go. So enjoy your lunch. Thanks for coming. Thanks for putting up with us. And uh, those are our Twitter handles. If you tweet at us, we always respond asterisk. We almost always respond asterisk. And yeah, so 